Okay, this is uh, welcome from Extramural Studies. I'm Fanula Darling. This is a very small group, and it's got nothing to do with the lack of popularity of this subject. But uh, we decided, because of the protests on campus, not to send out a reminder notice because we weren't sure who would read it and how they would react. Mm -hmm. So, but we still wanted to go ahead with the lecture. So it's a, it's a small but sincere mm -hmm. audience, and I think. Um, I mean, I, I'm fascinated by my own family tree, and I'm sure many of you are too. And so it's wonderful to have June McKinnon here mm -hmm. with us, um, who definitely the bug has bitten her, and she's been telling me about all, all the research she's done. She's a, a qualified historian and has written two books on her research into Cape families. Her speciality is scandal. <laughs> the scandal that we find. And females. And females, of course. <laughs> um, but you've also written a lot of articles for all the sort of historical society yes, journals yes. and the genealogical society journals. And then the, these two books, the one is A Tapestry of Lives, Women of the Cape in the 17th Century, and a very recent one, Wine, Woman and Good Hope, A History of Scandalous Behaviour in the Cape. So, June, a very warm welcome to you. Right. <laughs> Right, good evening everybody. Am I preaching the converted? Who of you have done your family tree? You. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, what do I press? Oh, this. There we go. Right. Um, South Africa has got some of the richest archival history for genealogists. When I did my research for my book, A Tapestry of Lives, Cape Women of the 17th Century, I wondered who the descendants of these women were. And most of them were very feisty women, and they turned out to be my ancestors. Because you don't only do your male family tree, you take all the women as well and marry in. On my mother's side, the Engelbrechts, I've got 350 names. I'm related to just about everybody in South Africa. Um, those of you who are about to set out on this journey, I must warn you, it gets hold of you. You can't get rid of it. You've got to have time. You've got to have passion and perse perseverance. And don't be afraid to ask other genealogists for help. No question is too stupid ever. And the staff at the Cape Town Arch the Cape Archives are very helpful, as are those in the South African Library. Um, some of the best, to start off, your best research um, article is Lombard and Hirsa, they're the um, editors, South African genealogies. You'll find them in the big yellow books, they're on your reference shelf of your libraries, most of the big libraries. I know Pan, uh, Plumstead Library hasn't got them, very tiny, but most of the big libraries have got them. And um, take your parents' names, your aunts and uncles, grandparents, siblings, whatever you know, and have a look through those books. Because quite often, you look at a tree, um, like I looked at the Engelbrechts, and there were two trees when I first started. The first one was very short, and the second one was longer. And I could see immediately, because my granny had nine children who survived, and I could see by the names who was my tree. So this is where it helps to know aunts and uncles' names and siblings of your grandparents if you possibly can. And also, um, if you've got Dutch and German um, ancestry, quite often the English also do this. The first son is named after the paternal grandfather, the second son after the maternal grandfather. The first daughter is named after the maternal grandmother, and the second daughter of the paternal grandmother. And once you're armed with this, Lombard and Hirsa also make mistakes, and quite often your family only goes as far as 1845 or something like that. Then take what you've got or what you haven't got and go to the Cape, Archi uh, to the Cape Archives in Rowland Street. They're open from, I think it's half past nine to four o'clock every afternoon except a Thursday. I only go on a Thursday because they close at seven. And to get out of there in the traffic is murder. So I walk out of there even as cold and raining a quarter to seven. And they're very helpful. And, and they look for um, the death notices. They're normally M-O-O-C. Death notices and estates. And there you'll find clues as to who your great-great-grandfather was 
and who their children were, what farm they lived in, what street they lived in, and quite often um, what they died of, which uh, can help you if you've got an hereditary disease in the family as well. Um, to, to search for um, material in the uh, archives in the Eastern Cape, Free State, Natal, and Gauteng, log in on your computer into the National Automated Archival Information Retrieval System, UNES. It's a database, and this will give you only the name that you type in, say it's John Collins, and the, perhaps the date of a death notice, but no further information, then you will have to contact through them a professional genealogist who will do the research for you. They don't often charge very much, and most of them, if they can't come up with anything and they hit a blank wall, they won't charge you at all. Um, then also, um, the Genealogical Institute of South Africa, which is part of the University of Stellenbosch, um, that holds the Dutch Reformed Church records. So, but there, um, you have to phone for an appointment, and a, a fee is payable per hour. Um, let me go down one. Yeah. Sorry, I was going up again. Right. Uh, pay a visit to the Genealogical Society of the Western Cape. Um, they're also uh, uh, of, uh, of the Western Cape, and um, they're in Pinelands. They uh, meet at Sassenev, which is a set of Afrikaans and Nederlands of Vereniging, on the Saturday, second Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock. And um, visitors are welcome. It's 10 rand, and you get a nice, some nice eats after the refreshments. And you can ask, the, um, our chairman always says, stand up who's here, who's a visitor, what are you researching? And then, you know, afterwards, people will come up to you and say, oh, wow, I'm researching Collins or Engelbrecht and talk to you. And um, they also have a fantastic website because um, they are part of um, the Genealogical Society of South Africa, which is a wonderful website. They are based in um, Pretoria, Johannesburg, and there you can find um, graveyards, and you can actually see the gravestones and read the epitaphs on some of those gravestones, which often clears up a mystery or a brick wall that you've been hitting. For information, for looking at most of you, you probably have British relatives. Um, I found one of the best sites was on the internet was Scotland's family. Don't use Scotland's people, you have to pay. Don't pay for sites. Scotland's family is free, and from that, you can find not only Scottish um, family, you can find Welsh and um, English, very seldom Irish. Irish is a big problem because um, the Irish only started uh, registering births in 1845. And my great-grandfather was born in 1842, so he wasn't registered. And marriages in 1848. But they do have a census that came out in 1850. So if you go into, just go uh, Google in Irish genealogy, census and see what you come up with and that's very good it's like the scottish one is wonderful they give you the streets that people lived in they give you the the their occupations how many children they had even you know the servants or the cook or whoever's living in the house is really good also um you can google in if you're really stuck um south african genealogy and then just type in a surname, like Fun of these days and afterwards. And um, you'll come up with various sites, like uh, pages of it, and you choose something. And you often find that some other Fun of these days and has done a lot of work for you. And um, you go through his family tree, which you'll find on that site, and they will sort out mysteries for you. It's a very good thing to try. Also, to put the flesh, once you've got these people, you've just got the names and the bare bones, and if you're lucky, where they've stayed, what the occupation was, um, you want to put flesh on the skeletons. Then you visit the South African Library in the gardens, 
and there's free laptops are allowed and pens. Oh, I must tell you, so the archives, you're not allowed to take a pen, only pencils, no, and you may take a laptop. Search in books and newspapers on the read and on the reading room shelves of the um, South African Library in the reading room. It's against the wall there. They've got the Cape Almanacs and the Jutas. And they start from about 1834, and they give you the streets of Cape Town as they multiplied. And they give you the people, the names of the people who lived in those houses and in the streets. And they give you the businesses and who lived in them. And when they get up to about uh, time of the Boer War, 1900, they don't go much further, about 1905, I think. Um, then you actually even, they go further up into the Northwestern Cape where they give you the names of farms and who was farming there. Now, that's a very interesting uh, um, books to look at. Uh, oh, I've done the Genealogical Society. Oh, the, um, RG, the, another um, family history society, they meet at the St. John's Church Hall in Weinberg on the third Saturday of every month at 2 p.m. And they've also got a website. And they specialize largely on English and British um, ancestry, whereas our genealogical, we do everything, you know, whatever. We had two years ago, we had every month, we had a speaker with Portuguese, um, Italian, Jewish, whatever, ancestry, because we do everything. Right. Let's go on. Um, our ancestors who arrived in the first 150 years were from the back streets of the cities of Europe and the small poor holdings. Carlos Kuman, he's wonderful. He used to run the manuscript room in the South African Library. He's a fantastic author. And he says, don't look in the hall, mirrored walls of Versailles and the palaces of Europe for your ancestors. They aren't there at all. The Thirty Years' War in Northern Europe caused inflation, unemployment. And people would, men were desperate, absolutely desperate for jobs. Widows and orphans, uh, there was corruption, and men flocked to the VOC for employment, nothing changes. The richest, which was the richest and biggest commercial company in the world, most of them were employed as soldiers or sailors. They were the lowest paid and the most badly treated in the company, no matter what their original occupation was. My maternal ancestor, Jan Engelbrecht, arrived as a soldier, but he was a cooper by trade. After three years for a sailor and five years service for a soldier at the Cape, you could become a free burger and you were granted land which they could never afford if they were back in Europe. Jan was one of the first trek birds to buy land in the Northwestern Cape. My book, Wine, Women, and Good Hope, A History of the Scandalous Behavior at the Cape, was inspired by drawing up family trees for relations and friends who were absolutely aghast at the hijinks of their ancestors. The skeletons just fell out of the cupboard, drunk, adulterous, conmen, wild and faster women, you name it. Most South African families have Indian, or what they used to call Malay slave blood. They weren't Malays. They were mostly from the Bay of Bengal. And Khoi Khoi blood in their family trees, which shocked even those who are professing not to be racist. Only a few have Khoi speakers as ancestors. The Haynes family is one of them. Willem van der Merwe was a soldier and an officer. And to be an officer, he had to be tall and strong. He was well over six foot to carry a big rifle. The VSC loaned the soldiers out to work for farmers because there was a terrible labor shortage. Willem worked at Kritzkia, which was the VSC's barn, where he impregnated his slave lover, Kodo of Guinea. She started labor, and he ran to fetch a touch of brandy to ease Kodo's pain. The foreman took pity on him and gave him a tot as well. His daughter was born, they called her Maria, and she became one of Simon van der Stoel's most trusted house slaves. In his will, Simon manumitted her, and she married Michael Haynes, and is the matriarch of the South African Haynes family. Willem then became a free burger, and he bought the farm Falkenberg. He married Elsie, who was the daughter of his next door neighbor, Jakob Klutti, they had umpteen children, one of whom is my ancestor. 
After their wives died, Willem and Jakob Klutti were warned to stop their sinful behavior of sleeping with their slave women and female koi koi servants. My ancestor, Tilman Hendricks, worked at Kuenhoop, um, which were, as a foreman, which was Van Riebeek's storage barn. After Van Riebeek left, he bought part of the land. This building has been restored, and it can be seen we set this way into six, the Leesbeck Parkway, it's on your right-hand side, but the original building was somewhere under the bridge. Van Riebeek had a lot to answer for. He planted wine, vines for wine and barley to make beer for all the passing trade of ships. And of course, the locals got in on the act. Tillman started selling arrack, which was cheap, highly intoxicating wine, was made from rice and also local brandy. But competition was stiff. Jakob van Rosendahl, he was one of the head gardeners, also one of my ancestors. He had bought Van Riebeek's farm, Boschevel, and he produced wine, so he sold wine from his vineyard. His wife, Katrain, was offering the first cup free. <clears throat> Tillman's wife, Macon, spread the word that that was not all that Katrain was offering, because she said that Katrain was a prostitute in Holland, a gutter snipe, his father was in the workhouse. Katrain took McKen to the Council of Justice, which was fined for slander. Tillman was the first case of drunk driving at the Cape. His next door neighbor was ex-German soldier and my ancestor, Hans Russ, whose farm stretched from the Lisbeck over the Rondebosch Common up the fountain, if only I had a bit of that. In 1662, Hans married Katarina Ustings, who arrived as a widow after her German mercenary husband died on board the ship. The wedding was in the little church which was attached to the fort. There wasn't a castle yet, it was a wooden mud fort. After a righteous reception, the guests in their cups climbed into the wagons for the journey back to their farms. Tillman, as drunk as a skunk, raced his wagon along the narrow path and upended Hans's wagon. Hans sprang up, yelled at Tillman to stop swearing in front of his bride. Macon grabbed Hans by his long hair, pulled him backwards, and Tillman stabbed him with a knife. Ah, sorry, I've lost. Thank you. The hilt of the knife broke off in Hans's ribs, and Hans was rushed hemorrhaging to the VOC hospital, which at the time was opposite the slave lodge, and which eventually became the colonial orphan chamber at the top of Adley Street where my, again, my ancestor, Danish surgeon, Peter van Muroff, removed the blade. Hans spent two months in hospital. Peter van Muroff was born in the shadow of Shakespeare Hamlet's castle, Elsinore, where his father was a soldier. When he came to the camp, he married Krotoa, or Eva, who was van Riebeek's koi koi children's nanny and interpreter. Their daughter, Petronilla, married Daniel Simon, plantation owner on Mauritius. And there are thousands of descendants because when the French took it over from the Dutch, they came to live in Stellenbosch. And their descendants include author Daniel Mathieu, historian Dan Slee, half my genealogy society, myself, F.W. de Klerk, Yanni Smuts, and Paul Kruger. I hope they're all turning in the graves. <laughs> And Hans Shane, poor thing, was mauled by a farm on a mobile line on his farm while he was mending the, farm, uh, the, the fence near the fountain. And he died of septicemia. Katerina sprang on a horse astride and bareback and shot the lion. Katerina's husband, number three, was killed by the Koi Koi for illegally hunting game in the territory which was at Macassar Beach. Number four was trampled to death by an elephant while bounty hunting hippos for the VOC. And then with five children under the age of 12, she was 36 years old, she applied for a, a widow's rice ration. And here comes the juicy part. Uh, the, the new governor was Simon van der Stel, who hated his wife, left her in Holland, brought his kids here. And he chose only married women as mistresses because he enriched their husbands and never said anything. Katarina had been widowed four times, her. Uh, that was good enough. He granted her land under the Steenberg Mountains, which she called Swanavada. 
Van der Stoel's farm could constantly the town stretched all the way there. Part of the deal was that Katrain had to care for a herd of Simon's cattle grazing next door. She must have done more than care for his cattle. Because when Commissioner from the VOC van Rieder to Drakenstein on a tour here complained to Sam van der Stel that he was a useless governor. The farmers were so poor, he said, listen, I'm going to take you to the four best farms. The last one was Katharina's farm. Van Rieder to Drakenstein raved about it. He said it was the best managed farm. The widow trained Russ, as he called her. After two years, this poor widow had orchards, fields of grain, livestock of every kind, and one of the most telling things, to see if your ancestor was well off, are the number of slaves that they, produ that they owned. Male slaves were far more expensive than females, although it should have been the other way around, because if you had a female slave and she had children, you never bought slaves again, because those children were your slaves forever, and you passed them on to your kids. And um, Train owned six male slaves and one female. And for this, you can also go onto the internet. You, um, you will find it sometimes in the old death notices, but a good um, site on your internet is Orphan Chamber Records uh, for wills and estates. And they detail just about every bit of crockery those people left, every little container where they put their perfume or their powder and their clothes and how many slaves they had, their farm, the farm instruments, everything is there. Katarina's farm is now Steinberg Estate. And um, those days, women didn't get granted title deeds, but she kept on at Van der Stel and eventually granted her one. So what more could one say? She was a good mistress. <laughs> and it's actually in a plaque on a a sort of the old brick wall, a little plaque there, granted to the widow trained Russ. I have two lines of descent from, uh, from our maternal Engelbrecht line. Her husband, number five, was a toy boy. He was 25 years old and a foreman, and she was 40. And two years later, she sold Swanner there, and she bought the farm Eustenburg. And if you go along the N1 towards Stellenbosch, the, the farm Eustenburg is on your right hand side with pylons and the winery. It's not open to the public. But, sorry, that's on the left. On the right is a road going, it's a big sign to lovely delicatessen and a delicious farm with food and wine tasting. And they've got a bit of the history of Eustenburg as well where they do the wine tasting. Another warning if you're doing genealogical research, don't believe all the sources while you're researching. That's why I say, check Lombard and Yesa, check the South African Library, check the archives everywhere you go. Francois Le Valent, a Frenchman, was fated by society at the Cape. He had rich sponsors in France, and he lived in the lap of luxury at Cape. His wife and children in Paris were starving. He never sent them anything. He boasted that the daughters of the Trekboers, Cornelius van der Westhuizen and Hermanus Engelbrecht, both of them were my ancestors, that's Hermanus farm, which was the last farm between the Kamisbach and the Harip River, which was the Orange River at the time. And nearly all the travelers and adventurers stayed at his farm, and they wrote beautiful, this was South, Af South African library is wonderful, and go and look at all the um, books that they wrote about these people. Levalian boasted that the daughters of the Czech boys, Cornelius van Westen and, and Engelbrecht, tried to seduce him, but he didn't fancy country bumpkins. Um, but when far more reliable sources, Colonel Robert Gordon, who was in charge of the castle when the English arrived, and James Patterson, stayed with the Van der Versailles and the Engelbrechts, their wives told that Gordon Patterson that they'd shambocked Lavalian out of their houses were trying to seduce their teenage daughters who'd rejected his advances and warned them that if they tried the same, the shambock was ready. The Valiant also labeled Claudina van der Vest as an liar when she told him that she was of French ancestry because her French had such a heavy Dutch accent. Her mother was Jean Guillemet, a French Huguenot born in Berlin, whose father was invited 
by the VOC to start the silk industry at the Cape. Spin Street behind Parliament is where the factory was, full of silkworms. And the brandy farm in Stellenbosch still has some of the original mulberry trees that he planted. Gordon and Patterson stayed on the farm of Jean, whose first husband was Jan Engelbrecht, Claudina and Amanus' father. Both explorers, described as the old French woman, who still spoke French fluently. And this is where you also have sometimes have stumbling blocks when you're doing research. Names are sometimes misleading because either the um, person who was writing it in didn't understand what you were saying because you were speaking French and he was Dutch or German, vice versa, or he just decided he was going to make it into a Dutch name. They changed Guillaume, became Guillaume, and Jean became Joanna. My French Huguenot ancestor, David Saint-Charles, became David Senecal. And your great-great-grandfather, you knew him as Johannes Jacobus Willem van der Merwe, but his death notice says he's Willy or Yaku. And you're thinking, who is this bloke? But that is what the family called him to distinguish from the other sixth cousin who were also named Johannes Jacobus Willem van der Merwe. Right. And while you're researching, wonderful historian, um, Phyllida Brooke Simon, she said to me, June, Sometimes you can sit a whole day at the archives or the South African Library and you can find, if you're lucky, one thing, sometimes nothing. But on the way, you find interesting things. So write them down. You'll always use it. And while researching, I went through Lady Anne Bonner's diaries. She was a great scandal monger and remarked that the babies of the Dutch women all came too early. Dutchmen told it was the marriages that came too late. Her diaries are full of gossip about local families and the elite British circle at the Cape. But she had a chip on her shoulder. She was in her 30s when she married Andrew, and of course she was the daughter of a Scottish Earl and very wealthy, and she had the title. Andrew was 12 years younger than her, a wastrel. Um, his father disowned him. Lady Anne secured him the post of secretary to the governor at the Cape. Andrew had fathered two sons with a courtesan in England. And somebody at the Family History Society, I suppose you people all know, said to me, what's the difference between a courtesan and a prostitute? Well, prostitutes, I come from behind the Bourbon's court curtain, the ones who stand with the mini skirts when it's four degrees and it's raining in Fort Tracker Road at night. And a courtesan is for the rich and, um, you know, the princes and the nobles and the wealthy. He'd had two children by her. Six-year-old Harvey accompanied the Barnards to the Cape, but he was so badly behaved that they put him on the next ship headed back for England. Lady Anne went back to England when the Dutch was scheduled to take over the Cape again. Andrew stayed on. He died from a fever at the Cape and left her all his belongings, as well as a small daughter he'd fathered at the Cape. To her credit, Lady Anne sent for the child, educated her, made her her personal companion, and tried to introduce her into elite society, where she failed, because a girl of color was not acceptable in those circles. And now my arch enemy, because I'm a feminist. <laughs> Cecil Rhodes was arch anti-feminist, and he met his match in Princess Radzivill, who professed to be married to Prince Radzivill, who fathered his three daughters. In London, she forged papers of introduction to Rhodes, stating she was a journalist separated from her princely husband. She booked a berth on the ship which Rhodes sailed back to the Cape on. She attempted to faint into his arms, but he sidestepped. <laughs> Cape society was fascinated by the supposedly real princess. And Rhodes eventually had to post a watch at his front gate, and he had a horse saddled at the back gate, and whenever she approached, he jumped on the horse, rode half the leather off in the opposite direction. She stole papers from his office, which are presumed to have been able to incriminate him in planning the Jamison raid, to blackmail him. After he died, she claimed support for a baby daughter. He'd fathered with her. The child proved to be non-existent. His executors prosecuted her for forging his signature on promissory notes and other documents, and they agreed that she was no princess but a courtesan living with Prince Radzivill. She landed up in prison at the Cape, and after release about two years later, hightailed it with her three supposedly reservoir daughters to America. 
In the case of Rad Princess Radzivill, I was lucky to consult a live source. One of the problems with genealogy is that most people are not interested in searching for dead family, most young people aren't interested in searching for dead family members. And by the time we start digging down the roots of that tree, our grandparents and our parents are no longer there to fill in vital information. The Radzivill family is a vast noble family with Polish and Russian branches. I wrote to my uncle, Valery Pickel, then age 85, he's now 90, living in Sydney in Australia. His father was the Russian Prince Radzivill, who fled during the Russian Revolution to Japan, China, and then to South America and gave up his title. Uncle Val sent me his family tree. It is stunning. It's this thick, and it's all done in calligraphy with all the crests and the names of the princes and the princesses and the history of Russia and Poland. Dating back to 1300 of the Polish and the Russian Radzivils, he told me no record of his father's Polish cousin marrying the supposed princess who arrived at the Cape. He agreed that she was a courtesan and living by her wits. Uncle Val was an engineer based in Singapore, and he was on a British boat, and he was put ashore in Cape Town because he had yellow jaundice. When he recovered, he met my aunt, pretty blonde, Heibrach Jacoba Maria Engelbrecht, and married her. So there's royal blood flowing through my cousins in Australia's veins, but not in mine. And it's also a warning to many aspirant genealogists. You always find people who claim they've got royal descent. It's mostly a myth. Our Cape ancestors were salt of the earth, so soldiers, sailors. Some of them eventually made their way up in the world. My sister-in-law insisted that her father was a McKinnon, was nobility, and born in a castle in Scotland. My daughter visited the castle and said there must have been burgies if they gave birth, gave, they gave birth to him there. Half the castle is still ruined and overgrown with weeds since Henry VIII destroyed it, and the restoration only began after World War II, and half of it is a museum, the rest in ruins. My husband wrote, who was a Freemason, he wrote the Freemason Lodge in Peterhead, so you must follow up any little bit that you've got, because John suddenly thought, oh, let's try the Freemasons in Peterhead. And they were wonderful. They sent us photographs of the graveyard in Peterhead with the McKinnon plot with about four or five generations of McKinnons built, uh, buried there. They were a mine of information, but there's no nobility at all. My brother-in-law, Peter Douglas's mother, was a member of the Fairbridge family. The family was squeaky clean, so I could find no scandal. But one of the employers, did the trick. <clears throat> Historian Phyllida Brooke Simons' grandmother was Ethel Reader Fairbridge. She married Henry Curry, who was Cecil Rhodes' secretary. They got engaged secretly because Rhodes told his staff they were not allowed to marry. When Rhodes found out about the engagement, he ranted on about having to lose Harry to Ethel Reader and threatened to fire him. He bided his time, and when the couple reluctantly invited him to their wedding in 1892 at the reception, he loomed over Ethel Reader and declared in a stage whisper, I'm very jealous of you, you know. His wedding present was to uproot them to Johannesburg. There, Harry found Rhodes's younger brother, Ernest, in charge of the gold fields instead of himself. Ernest was totally incompetent, and all the disasters, and he made many, he blamed on Harry, who headed back to Cape Town, stormed into Rhodes' office, and demanded to be re reinstated. Rhodes sat reading the newspaper, which he kept in front of his face, never once looked at Harry, made no comment. Harry resigned and sued Rhodes. The Prime Minister then decided to pay back the money out of court. Nothing's changed. I hope you all have as much fun as I've had in pulling piles of skeletons out of your ancestral closets. Any questions? No? Princess <laughs> Radzivill, I mean, I live in Port Bay, and um, she was tried in the, uh, you know, everybody drives part, everybody sat in the stop go right next to what used to be the courthouse. Yes, Bay, yes. I'm yes. This, this, it's on the corner of Clearboat, uh, you can go up to Boys Drive. Uh, yeah. So she 
she must have been tried there because he must have been resident in Musenberg. Yes, yeah, she lived out in the southern suburbs where, because he, he was at, at the cottage yeah. at the time, because he died in his cottage, Rhodes Cottage. Anybody else? No? <laughs> I'm very deaf. I'm, I'm 76. <laughs> when I was doing some research, well, honestly, this is on sla uh, it focused on some slave woman. I guess. Come closer. Come okay. closer. <laughs> yeah. Stand yeah. next to you. She's got a mic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got a mic. Then, you, then they can hear what you're saying as well. Come here. You you're speaking the mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah, but then you're speaking the while saying they can hear what you're saying as well. We can hear you. Oh, okay. So they, come here. Come here, then they can hear your question. Okay. I was just wondering. Um, okay. I was just wondering, how does one, if you're doing genealogical research, say on a, on a, not a white family? Yeah. Because you often find the genealogical records only trace. Um, I mean, I know those sources because I, yes, I did research yes. in the Cape Archives. Mm -hmm. You have to look for if you're looking for say somebody was a slave, etc. Then you have to look through the the, the records of the master surname. Yes. And yes. then also. Um, so I was wondering, how does one then begin to do genealogical research using these resources, which is organized under um, the records of mostly white people? Uh, so how would one begin uh, then, for example, if you want to do genealogical research on your family? If, if you don't uh -huh. know, you know, I was just wondering, yeah. how does one go about what, do you go the same route and then try and, and, and trace the, 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 the origins through the possible intermediate. Yeah. In, in, yeah. in Lombard and Hesse, they have got certain sections, especially the very big families, where they will put their, um, like uh, the Engelbrecht family, the oldest brother, he was disowned by the family, and he married a Koi woman, and they've got whole strips of Koi descent from descent of Koi family there. And some of the others have got that as well. And about, oh, it was about six years ago, um, Lombard and Hesse, I think you could find Stellenbosch University, the Genealogical Institute, and ask them hey, what has happened, or UWC, I think it was from UWC. They were going to do research into what you were looking for, people of coloured family, families, of colour, slave blood and koi and whatever. So those who were, came from, uh, as you say, from outside of South Africa, for example. Yeah, well, uh, that's the only help I can give you. And then uh, if you look at, uh, have you ever looked at Krukhunstunde Grenze? It was banned at one stage, but it's in uh, most public libraries on the reference shelf, Krukhunstunde Grenze. And I think it's by Hirsa. Oh, and it's also at the archives. Oh, okay. And that gives you like a lot of um, intermarriage and in that. But I mean, when you start going through all these families, you always, in every South African family, um, I was just saying for Nilo before we started, my friend Mike Wood, um, he's Catholic, but he decided when his son was 13, he wanted to have a big thing, I mean, his grandson, like the Jewish people have, a big thing. And he said, June, you've got to do the family tree. And he looked at me and he said, you won't find any Kwe like you got or Indian slave blood in your minds or um, Scottish and, and British, English. And when I started to look, there was no British, no Scottish, they're all Irish. And of course, you take the woman who marry in. And um, to the first woman who married into the Wood family tree in about 18 foot sack, their surnames were Bird and Birch. And they, uh, they were from Ireland, and their fathers had married Maria van der Kop and Sarah van der Kop. And when you got van der Kop, that means it's either slave blood or no, not normally koi, not normally koi, but. And you find in every family. And so this is what tickled me to write this book because people were. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. I can't hear, I'm very deaf. <laughs> Can you? 
Yes, I went to Gnadendal when, um, before I started my master's degree, because I was doing it through UNESA, and I was having a fight with um, the head of the history department, and I said I wanted to do Start of Feminism, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, not that I'm a like, rabid Christian, but it was feminist. And, and he said to me, oh, go down to UWC because they're having um, a whole symposium for four days with historians and you'll find somebody who will get you out of that stupid idea. And the first, I'm digressing, the very first lecture was a Canadian professor stood up there and he said, why has nobody written than the Women's Christian Temperance Union got the vote for women? So I, I couldn't wait to speak to him afterwards. And then, I um, can't think of his name. He wrote, that professor, he wrote the book on Gnadendal. He wrote two books on the missionaries there. And he was there and he took us over the weekend. We went there for the day and we sat in the church and we went to the little museum. It was wonderful. It was really fabulous. Yes. Yeah. Come over here. <laughs> yeah, go, Matthew, go. You need the microphone. You think I can hear you? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's only until 1836. From there, I can't. Can't go back can't further. Go back further. It's a lot of slave and some of the Bessels family. Yeah. They say they sort of settled in the Caledon area. Yeah. Yeah. And even they say that uh, that my my ancestors aren't really descended from the Bessels. They say that the Bessels had left earlier. Yeah. So, but for some reason, she kept the Bessels surname. Yeah. And then my line starts from there. It's quite interesting that you're saying vessels because um, I'm starting my second book and um, my third book, my third book, right? <laughs> and it was as good as stories. And there was, you know, the, this, these uh, rebel Boers who were in Slachter's Neck Rebellion and they were really a wild bunch. And um, they sometimes married their first wife, but then they just had mistresses off that. And this one, her name was Dorothea Vessels. And she was of colored blood. She was, had a white father, I think a colored mother, and it was vessels. So that's interesting. And that was on the Eastern Frontier, up near Slachtersvik. Um, June, I, I show both Matthew um, and Zulefra the, um, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Oh, website. yes, yes. Because there you can actually see transcripts of the, the baptisms, because that was where all the baptisms were recorded. Yeah, yeah. Try to raise my voice. So yes, yeah, good. <laughs> the, um, the 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 church records are particularly good for people for records of people of colour. That is so. Mm. But uh, to, uh, before about 1833, as you say, there's not much. Yeah. But 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 in the Lutheran Church in Strand Street, their first yes, it was a slave place, church. Their yeah. first baptisms took place in 1780. Yeah. You won't get anything earlier than that. But in the in the Inchikeg, look, there was only, the only church that was allowed was the Dutch Reformed Church. Mm. And then from 1780, you could also baptize and then worship in the Lutheran Church. So anybody who had married anybody of color, or there was anything, or you were Roman Catholic or Jewish, anything like mm. that, you, you, could, you could then use that church, the, uh, the Lutheran church. The problem is this, that those records were available in the Cape archives till about three years ago. Mm. And the congregation of the Lutheran church, now you must remember there are, there are various Lutheran churches mm. who aren't exactly the same faith. The one in St. Martini, for instance, is yeah. not the same Lutheran church as the one in Strand Street. And there's one in you know, the Martin Melkhouse. So. That's the one. I'm yeah. about. They've got and a lot of records there. They've taken their records back. Yeah. And those records are not accessible and not available. Yeah. They've ne not been digitized either. Mm. Now, it is such a pity. Um, it is a religious issue. They don't want their records to be public. In fact, it's very much about the Latter-day Saints. Because they mm. 
They rebuilt his ancestors. And, and the Lutheran Church said, no ways do we want our ancestors to be rebaptized by okay. whoever. So, so but, but if one day we, they will get it, become available, they, they want to digitize them, but obviously the Cosmani and so on. So maybe, maybe mm. the next generation of congregation will have a different view on it. But the, the, the Muslim records are impossible. Because mm. there are no gravestones really, there's no record of mm. births and marriages, and it's almost impossible. So mm. then you have to do it by word of mouth, which amazingly is often very accurate. Not in not Hamsi, but but for instance, for the Yonker family, there was always this discussion on whether Adolf Yonker was of uh, white descent or what mm. his issue was. And there was a fantastically well-researched article published by, I think, Jakob Strauss and M.C. Lowe on going back to his roots that both his parents came from Indonesia. Mm. And I'm not talking about 1800s, I'm talking about 1600s. So, mm. so now and then you get these gems where people through the slave records are able to decipher these things mm. and try and translate. How would the Dutch at the time have translated those names into Dutch sounding names? So yes. But this better. takes dedication mm. of enormous proportions. But can mm. you know, this is where it's worthwhile to join genealogical societies because in my society, um, we part of the one of South Africa, but I say we meet in Pinans, and we've got uh, members who have gone over to Salt Lake City, who've gone to The Hague, have gone to places in Germany, and they have looked at original, and we publish quarterly the Capensis, which is our, it's only for members, and they write on these, you know, roots going back. And then, of course, we get familiar, which is the, the um, genealogical society of, of South Africa that comes from Pretoria. And there are also people who've gone overseas and looked at records there. And the uh, Family History Society in Weinberg, a lot of their members have gone back to England. I've some fascinating talks where they show you the crusaders lying like this in the church that, you know, they've gone back to family records. how primitive the original settlers were here. Mm. They, you spoke about they were like the ragtag kind of They were, in Europe. yeah. yeah they really were. <laughs> they ate communally out of a single bowl, six to eight men per bowl. Mm. And that's, those were the only utensils they had. They may have had a spoon, and they probably shared a spoon. Mm. That was it. And if, a few uh, people who could write, like from Ribi and from Estelle and so people. But, so a big change in South Africa and the, the, the colonists came when the French Huguenots arrived. But so even the French Huguenots were very poor, most of any de Villiers brothers were quite wealthy and they built it because they had to make their own farmhouses, till their own land. But they were landowners before. Yeah. They could read and write. And it was a huge change that yeah. I mean, the, the, the strange thing though is that within two generations, most of French lost their language. Yeah, well, that was uh, Simon van der Stel. He made that, um, that was part of his law. He actually put um, Dutch and German settlers, if you were French Huguenot, then he put Vanilla there because she's Irish. And he put her in the next one because she's German. And then you only got a French Huguenot to sign separate you. And he didn't want them to have. <laughs> I just want my surname. <laughs> another comment question here. My records are fairly complete as far as my South African families are concerned. Which are? The Villiers and Clutie. Oh, they're unrelated to you on my Adrian says out of my farm, my mother's grandmother's side. <laughs> Yes. Um, I don't believe they came from La Rochelle at all. Um, La Rochelle was where they were walled up by the um, 
by the, the French government for such a long time was when La Rochelle fell uh. that the Huguenots had to get, get up, leave the city and, 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 and flee. Um, mm. I think this, the, 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 there must be another story. There is um, a book um, in the, I know it's in the Belleville Library, it's probably in other libraries, I can't think what it's called. Is it Morris Boucher? That's the one. I'm not quite sure. And he talks about where they, he gives you where they come from. It's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, like the Jabez who walked barefoot up to get to Holland and they had nothing left and they had no shoes left and things like that. And he, he, and he even gives you some of the, the de Villiers, he, the letters that the brothers wrote to their parents or their parents wrote to them. It's very interesting. It's quite a thin little book, but it's very intense. Belleville Library's got it, but to go on to um, Cape Town, a brocade, B-R-O-C-A-D-E, like a um, material, brocade Cape Town Library Services. And once you get into that, um, go into um, Quick Survey, and then you type in Morris Boucher, and, you, and then you'll find, and they give you all the districts. I always just put all districts. And then you'll find um, which library it's in. But it's definitely in the Belleville Library. And then somebody like Jan Kluger, who came here with Henrique, presumably as a mercenary. With, sorry? With Henrique. Um, the first clearly arrived here with Henrique. He was on, on the ship. Um, and he, uh, he was uh, designated as a soldier. Uh, it's it's always been said that his name was actually Kluten. Kluten, yeah, K-L-U-T-E-N. Kluten yeah. from Germany, from, from yeah. Um, yeah. near Cologne. Now, yeah. presumably the Dutch East Dutch. India Company have Richards. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, um, again, my genealogical society, I, um, in one of his, either the Capensis or the Familiar, I think it's the Capensis, about two, three years ago, Somebody went right back to his background and how he went backwards and forwards with his children, where he came from and who his parents were and um, the birth records. If you, um, if you uh, want to take down my email, I'll have a look and what see which you, copy it was. For the branch or for the book? I was just behind you. Behind you, right behind you. Oh, uh, here. Which one is Maurice it? Boucher. Oh, this one. Maurice one. Boucher. <coughs> Maurice Boucher. I haven't got my glasses on. I know. I know. I'm no. so no. going to a quick, uh, a quick, around, uh, <laughs> quick search. I don't know which area he stays in because mine's always area five. It's behind the Bureau of Curtain. Available <laughs> in the following libraries. Yeah. I can just reserve it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Belleville, Central Library, Durbanville, Somerset West, Weinberg. Well, that, that's, that's hmm. yeah. you, want, you want me to give you the shelf number? Uh, if, you, if you want to take my email, you can, and then I'll have a look to see, I'll scratch through my copies and see which one it is. It's June, like the month of June. M C K at mweb.co.za. So, this is the site we went to with Matthew. Uh, is that how you spell your name? And then, so this is the family That's search. interesting, and, yeah. And, and because South Africa's got all this, so many people who've recorded um, births and, and that... Uh, yes, that's a wonderful site, that family search. I don't know, did, did, was any of these one that you recognized? No. You couldn't remember a first name, could you? Okay. Anyway, that's a site. Are there any other questions or comments? Or? Let me make another comment. Since there was this discussion of people of color, if you, in the African 
Afrikaans families until about 1860. I think the Afrikaans people and the English people in South Africa stayed completely apart. And even past the Boer War, there was very little mixing between English speaking people and Afrikaans speaking people in the country. So the Afrikaans people, if I can call it like that, as a group, were quite contained in a certain way. If you trace back the family trees of Afrikaans people, any name, any surname, and they would have most likely either in the as, as the as the progenitor or as the first uh, generation a person of colour, and not always women. But if it's women, it's largely slaves from the Indian subcontinent. Large, mm. strange thing. Very few coy people. In the Afrikaans people, but almost, I would say. But that was the government. The, the the governors at the time, there were about twenty to thirty European men to one European woman at the yes. Cape, and they said, start marrying your. Um, they called them Malay slaves, but they were mostly from the Bay of Bengal. They were Indians. Marry them, and you. We will help you, but you had to pay. You had to pay a bribe, and champ quite often if the if the husband died, and the price wasn't paid off, that poor woman as a widow to keep paying for a price for having married that man. But this is what they 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 said: you must just start marrying them. But also, why 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 this distinct, how should I say? I would say preference, but distinctly so that that it's the it's the slave girls. And I think it's because they had skills. They were seamstresses, yeah. they could cook, they could do things. Whereas the local people, the indigenous people, didn't have the skills. And so it was this closer to the home, as it were, I think. Uh, it was difficult, but, but if you look at the records, yeah. it's not. Because the, the queer people didn't want don't want to be laborers, they wanted to keep their clan lives. And just a few of them started work as but of course the smallpox did that. There's terrible smallpox epidemics where their clans disintegrated and they were so ill. So then they'd start working as servants for the farmers and filter into the towns and villages. Whereas um, the Indian uh, the Indian slave women and most of the Indian slave men they were the people who were the carpenters and um, they could make coaches and carve furniture and the women, as you say, were cooks and nannies and they could sew and they worked in your house. The black slaves, you worked in your garden and in, in your, on your farmlands. They're the people who did the heavy labor, even the women. It was terrible. They had babies on their backs and they had to give birth in the fields and things like that. Whereas your um, Indian slave women, Malay slaves and Koi servants were much were sort of more prized and you looked after them better. Wasn't there also the fact that there was a, a, a great interaction between the Tavia and the Cape? Yes, and yes. The Dutch way of living in the Tavia, there was a lot of cohabitation and marriage, cross marriage, and um, between the Indian. That's right, Mary Busson.
<laughs> and if you listen to Cape Talk, uh, radio, um, Dion Bing, he was like, uh, was in Cape Town, a surf report. And his mom, Merle Bing, um, she showed me the one day a beautiful ceramic dishes with um, von Reeder to Oetzorn. It was a wedding present to a great, great grandmother. And she said, Regine, will you do my family tree? And she's descended from Anna de Kunin through her mother's line, and this is where the dishes came from. And if you look at that photo of Anna, that was Mel. She was this tiny, beautiful, petite so little person. In the shops, they're 200 rand. Um, <laughs> 